Yeah, a very warm welcome to you all to this uh, joint webinar, uh, best practice webinar of UPU and IPC uh, on the topic of green revenue business models for the postal sector. This is the first joint webinar that we have uh, organized again after five years. Um, the reasons for that were, of course, COVID and personnel changes, etc. But we knew that it is very much appreciated and we can also see it to the number of participants. So we thought we have to schedule these things again. Um, <clears throat> today, the topic is a very interesting one, but it might also be a little bit a difficult one. Uh, but for us, James and, and me, we thought that is exactly a good reason to do this topic. Um, so uh, on the agenda today, we have three speakers, and I do hope that at least one is already present. I can't see that. James, is one already present? Yeah, so I could start, by the way. Um, that would be so, fine to do that. When... Okay. Um, so uh, the first speaker, or the one that is there, uh, depending, uh, the first speaker will be uh, Adeline Gordineau from Geoptis, France. Uh, the second speaker will be Ren Yunchu from Chinyo, China. And the third speaker will be Miles Durant from Royal Mail. So after each of these presentations, we will have a, a short moment of uh, possibility of asking short questions. If you have more in-depth, deep questions, then uh, please uh, put them on an email to us, to James or to me, and we can easily forward them to the speakers then. Um, you already saw that the, uh, the meeting is recorded. Um, and uh, the last thing that I wanted to say, yes, is that after the three speakers, James will uh, give a short synthesis of the three presentations and link them to the, uh, to the topic and put them into perspective. Uh, and then there is time, we hope there is time for a bit of discussion. So um, let's start with the first speaker. And the first speaker is James. Uh, it's Adeline uh, Godino from uh, Geoptis. Ah, yeah. She is online. Um, so, I, Adeline, are you ready? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi, Hello. Adeline. Nice yes. to see you again. Nice to, nice to see you. Sorry. So, I can, I can start. You can just, uh, yeah, please go ahead, Adeline. Okay. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Adeline Godino, and I'm based, I'm based in Paris. Sorry in advance for my strong French accent. Um, I'm Chief Marketing Officer for the Local Efficiency Business Unit, and it's um, subsidiary uh, Geoptis. It's a pleasure to be here today to discuss uh, uh, the challenges facing Geoptis. So um, just a few words. What is Geoptis? Uh, Geoptis is a French company that... Uh, collect um, field data using camera equipped uh, vehicles. It's also for the data visualization platform in SAS mode. And um, Geoptis is um, aimed primarily uh, at local authorities and businesses. So before uh, I tell you more about our company, um, I'd like to share with you uh, two key figures. Um, the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, two key figures that you can see uh, on the slide. Um, so uh, first, we know that companies are becoming more and more um, efficient, but are faced with local descriptions um, that require them to react quickly and very quickly to ecological and economic transition. So in this context, they need to rely um, on data to make the best decisions um, and decisions objectively. So, however, uh, we note that uh, it's on the slide, 76% um, uh, of French business leaders admit that they do not base their decisions on data. And the same is true of local authorities uh, on the slide too. Um, 83% of uh, which consider that their level of awareness of the challenges posed by data or acculturation uh, is insufficient. So uh, I think that these figures clearly confirm uh, the importance of putting data into perspective. 
um, both um, within companies and within local authorities. Uh, so um, the next slide, please. Uh, so what, um, yes, thank you. Um, so um, um, the transition is, is perfect uh, to deepen Geoptis value proposition, uh, our DNA in Geoptis. Let's reveal the territorial local data. So to fully understand the challenges of our value proposition, um, it is important to understand our um, beliefs um, and missions. So in Geoptis, we believe um, that um, access to objective local data is crucial to understanding market dynamics, uh, making informed decisions, and um, um, gaining support and managing initiative effectively. So that's um, why we have developed an easy to use um, zero decision platform. Um, and this uh, platform is directly uh, accessible to decision makers that integrates the data needed to understand the attractiveness of a territory um, or um, location. So our platform is built on an ecosystem of local data it's very important, huh? including most open data, uh, for example, um, I don't know, demographic uh, data, health data, premium data sets from private producers, data imported by users, so um, uh, that in turn that data, and postal data collected in the field. Um, in addition, geomarketing expert professional services are available to help customers um, maximize their data, uh, offering um, intelligence analysis, analysis uh, to put customer data into perspective with nation, national data. Um, so, and um, just a few words about our platform and the uh, three main missions of our platform. One first mission, sorry, uh, democratizing access to that data. Uh, so we enable everyone, experts, and non-experts like to consult the data of their choice across the world of friends. And second mission, making decision uh, making um, more objective. Um, in Geoptis, we provide a geo-decisional solution that helps customers make informed uh, choice and progress rapidly to reach their full potential. And um, the last mission, um, supporting economic and ecological transitions. Our data, data helps local authorities and businesses understand and adapt uh, to changes linked to territorial, demographic, um, ecologic, and energy transitions. So in short, um, Geoptis uh, manages the entire value chain from data collection to visualization on an intuitive and collaborative mapping and a data visualization platform. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so before presenting the use cases, uh, I'd like to share our processes uh, with you through two examples, a local authority and a company. Whatever the target, we first need to uh, identify the challenges and needs of our customers and try to understand how to respond to them using the, da the data collected uh, and its visualization in the platform. So the first example is Concarneau, a French commune in uh, Brittany. Um, and, and no, it's not a use case, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, yes, it's a Concarneau, a French commune uh, in uh, Brittany, which wanted to take advantage of its fraud audit to enhance it with georeferencing elements, pavements, or um, vertical and horizontal signage and street furniture. In practical terms, it's not easy to present, but I'm going to try. Uh, so um, three uh, steps. We contact um, the nearest postal establishment in Concarneau. The postmen fit their vehicles with cameras so they can audit the road during their rounds. Then the information is transmitted to the uh, video coding unit in Le Mans in France. This team, this team sorry, uh, records each item filmed and indicates uh, precisely the condition of the items viewed. And finally, the information is injected into the platform for 
perfect data visualization. Uh, so how did the customer benefit? Um, so that a neutral perspective on the prioritization of its work. The local authority has at its, at its disposal um, objective information to convince elected representatives of the need to um, continue investing in road maintenance. And the second example is that uh, of Mutuel, Mutuel Catalan, a regional mutual, mutual based in France. Uh, it's a, it's a, with, I think with 100 employees in the south of France. Um, so Mutuel, La Mutuel Catalan was looking to gain a better understanding uh, of its operating environment in order to make strategic and operational decisions. Uh, the, the challenges were two, three challenges. Identify um, optimal locations for new branches, monitor and benchmark branch performance, and understand uh, its network. So we therefore provided our da geodata visualization platform and our expertise in geomarketing in two uh, main areas, a study to uh, uh, access the viability of new branches and the creation of reports um, with personalized uh, indicators. So the benefits for mutu La Mutual Catalan were immediate. The mapping reports and recommendations made it possible to invalidate, it's very important, invalidate the branch uh, initial location, um, thereby preserving the return uh, on investment. I would add uh, that um, these recommendations were possible thanks to, use, to the use sorry, of the um, mutual internal data combined with open data, health, uh, sociodemographic, et cetera. Uh, so now I'd like to illustrate our value proposition with a few uh, use cases. So the next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, first use cases, uh, auditing roads and uh, cycle paths on the next slide. And I'm sorry because uh, it's uh, one, uh, yes, use case with uh, two slides. Uh, so two main objectives. Um, uh, for the uh, auditing road and cycle path, uh, optimize management and expenses, and in particular, reduce the carbon, carbon footprint by uh, facilitating management and optimizing maintenance expenses um, and uh, or by optimizing vehicle uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, the, um, the second uh, objective um, is to uh, improve the user experience through sustainable and safe solutions by encouraging uh, the use of soft mobility. Um, another use case, um, the next slide, please. Um, it's um, the air quality uh, measurement. Um, it's, um, the objective is to um, measure air quality on a daily and hyper-local basis. So two major impacts, a better understanding sorry, of the origins and the impact of pollution and the involvement of citizens in this important process. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the other uh, use cases are extremely, extremely sorry, interesting uh, as uh, they are illustrated by the platform. Here is the example of Veligo, uh, which uh, offers bicycles for hire in the Ile-de-France uh, region uh, in Paris too. Uh, this map generated by uh, our platform, uh, Geopti Solution, uses color shams to illustrate the demand for bike rentals in different cities. And um, you can see that um, the darker the red, the greater the demand for bike hire. You can also zoom um, in a finer uh, area if you want. Um, on the next slides, it's the same with the map we developed for one of our customers. Uh, uh, it's uh, the next slide, please. Uh, yes, the ne next slide. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, I have a, I don't know, I have a, a, a problem with my, uh, with my, oh, yes, with my computer, just one minute, I'm sorry. Yes, it's okay, sorry. Um, so uh, the next slide is the same with the map we developed, so, so for the Banque, uh, for La Banque Populaire. Um, 
whose problem was to identify the distance in kilometers between employees and the place of work. Our client's objective, La Banque Populaire, uh, was to see how um, they could improve the quality of life of, of their employees and offer them sustainable uh, mobility. Uh, the next slide, please. And uh, the last slide shown shows uh, sorry, an example of a dashboard to complement the map display. This dashboard, um, also known as, um, I don't know in English, a portrait robot uh, of the region, compares the data for a region, in this case, a French department um, um, in Paris, department, department of the Les Yvelines, with that uh, for other regions in France. Here is an example of what we have done for La Poste Group uh, as part uh, of its uh, CSR uh, approach. Uh, so uh, that's it uh, for me. Um, uh, now you know almost everything about objectives. Uh, so I'm sorry, but if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate uh, to put them in writing. And uh, uh, um, I, I, get, I, uh, I will get back to you as soon as uh, possi as possible. And, uh, and uh, thank you uh, all for your NT attention. And, and thank you, James, for, for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adeline. I understand that you're pretty short for time. So yes. if there I'm is sorry. any question right now, very short, but then as Adeline already said, you can always fire us. You have our email addresses. Uh, ask Adeline uh, more in-depth questions. So thank you very much, Adeline. Are there any questions on the chat, Veronique? No. Veronica is very, I said Veronique, but it's Veronica, of course. Okay, well, thanks. Thank, thank you very much. I don't much. see any questions so far. Okay, no. okay. Veronica, thank you. Thanks thank and you have a great much. day. Bye, Bye. Adam. Bye. Okay, then we move on to the second speaker, uh, which uh, is uh, Ren Yunshu from China. I saw her already on the screen, so I'm pretty sure she's there. So, Ren, if you're ready, please. Yeah, I'm ready, thank you. You can start your presentation, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair and James. And uh, now I will begin with my presentation. Uh, first of all, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to share the commendable efforts made by Tanya Group. Uh, Maybe you will wonder uh, what's the meaning of Cainiao in Chinese. It means green hand uh, because, um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, I will introduce Cainiao first. Uh, Cainiao is formed by Alibaba Group, which is the e-commerce platform in China, in China. And we are found in 2013. So Tanya is much more younger than other express in the uh, express in China. So uh, we make this name for ourselves. But currently we handle an average of 4.5 million cross-border parcels daily. So now we are the world's uh, first e Ashline cross-border e-commerce logistic company with the solution covering cross-border express delivery, the global supply chain, and the overseas local service. So through our disruptive uh, solutions, such as 10-day global delivery and 5-day global delivery, uh, Tanya help small and medium-sized enterprise engage in cross-border trade. Mm, Tanya operates logistic uh, facilities in strategic locations around the world, serving over 200 million uh, countries and regions with its technology, DNA, ingrained 
into every aspect of the network. Through China Post solution, it also built the largest digital pickup and drop off net, uh, network in the world. Mm, so this is the whole business mode of our uh, company and the digitalization operation and the globalization is the foundation of our business mode. Mm, next slide, please. So moving forward, let's turn our uh, attention to the core theme of today's sharing, examine the strategies and initiatives that uh, Cainyang has implemented to implement it to ensure a sustainable reduction in carbon emissions. Uh, to begin with, we uh, collaborate with the global supply chain partners uh, just like Nike, we said in this example, and uh, to craft custom customized solutions that prioritize sustainable and environmental uh, steps. Our goal is to integrate the uh, eco-conscious practices into every aspect of their supply chain management, ensure that their operations are not only efficient, but also contribute positively to the environment. So we can say the Nike's Nike Reuse a Shoe program has been expanded in a big scale and uh, with the help of our company, the recycling of old shoes has become easier and it has been now covered 22 universities in whole China, uh, such as the Central, East and the South, affecting more than 750,000 students in this project. The Nike Renew, project is joined is jointly initiated by Nike and uh, Antiforest. Uh, the Antiforest is another subsidiary corporation of Alibaba, which is our uh, our glo global uh, group. And the China expanded its recycling network across various universities. And based on um, 3,000 university campus China post station, this is very crucial. We have the network post station in most of the universities in China. And consumers can take their old shoes to university campus China station uh, offline. And also they can order this service online. Next slide, please. So we can see the loop of this uh, project. Uh, online consumers can search for the Nike Renew project through the app to book a recycling service. And offline, they can give the old shoes to the uh, Tanya campus station and then we, our company, sent the collected old shoes to the rubber recycling enterprise, and uh, renew the the renew enterprise will then process them into uh, into the rubber tracks. The raw material will be delivered to the rural elementary schools and used to create the rubber tracks. So this is the uh, business uh, mode. And uh, in this project, the initial initiators is Nike and uh, Cainyo. Uh, very important for, uh, is Nike provides the budget of this project. And uh, the key point is Cainyo provides the recycling channels and the acts 
as the project manager to coordinate the entire process. And also the government policies encourage the initiative. And the beneficiary is uh, sufficient for service sustainability. So this is the Nike example. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. The next example is uh, we bring, uh, we built the green supply chain with Nestle. Uh, in 2020, we, Cainiao and Nestle established a strategy green partnership We built the uh, program named Nestle Coffee Packaging Home Recycling. Uh, this, can uh, this program is first launched by Cainiao app. Also, we have online and uh, offline process, process. This is sustainable green supply chain for the Nestle Coffee in China uh, market, we can provide the packaging, storage, uh, transit, distri distribution, delivery, and then collection and recycling of the packaging. Mm, but the scale is in this program, not all over the Chinese market for Nestle. So we do the green supply chain from the delivery end and the cooperative cooperation grew gradually depended extending from the end to the industrial chain to the upstream and the consumers of national coffee can enjoy the rich coffee and then through our network to make a free appointment for uh, coll to collect the coffee product packagings at their door and all they can send it back to the brand's designed packaging recycling point. Mm, next sl slide, please. Thank you. Now we come to the e-waste uh, reverse logistic to collect the e-waste from the doorstep. Uh, now this is a very, uh, we have a very good benefit policy background in this period. The state encouraged the exchange of old for new to helping uh, consumers to update to more environmental friendly goods. But there are some challenges in the industry of the home appliance, such as the national scrapping volume of home appliance is nearly 200 million units, uh, 80 million entire dismantling factories and 120 million entire enter the secondhand market posing safety hazards to human being. So we play the role of PM in this program. We deliver personnel dismantle old machines at consumers' home while protecting consumers' rights. Uh, China manage the collection, quality inspection, basic information capture, and deliver to the mantling factories. This ensure a high rate of high quality recycling. Uh, our experience is this has laid the foundation for build a new replacement and recycling logistic system, the one step pickup and delivery has a daily scale of 2,000 orders, serving nearly 1 million consumers a year. We can see the pictures is of this uh, one-stop uh, pickup and the deliver program. 
online, the consumers order new applications, uh, order new appliance and uh, collection of the old ones. And Tangle provide one-step pickup and deliver service, uh, 2,000 orders a day. And then we send the collected e-waste to formal recycling enterprises. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our carbon asset management platform. And uh, Tanya has established itself in the express logistic industry, uh, harnessing in the harnessing the power of digital technology to create a suite of carbon asset management system and the life cycle life circle emission reduction service. We are proud to offer low carbon logistic solutions that are both initiative and effective. We have launched an online carbon reduction points program to motivate consumers, encouraging a reduction in emission across the entire supply chain. Since June 2022, our green logistic initiative have been part of the Zhejiang province carbon inclusive platform. And Zhejiang province is one of the most uh, developed uh, <laughs> province in the East South China. Thank, Thank you, Thank you yeah. very much. Ren, I don't know if you can still talk because I think we are missing your audio connection. The largest online express recycling platform in China. We have expanded our reach to 11 province level cities and have granted over 1 million registered users. This is a testament to our commitment to sustainability and the significant impact we are making in the field of green logistics. Uh, furthermore, we, has, we have taken the lead in introduction the personal carbon reduction bill which generated a personal green logistic footprint for every individual consumers. This initiative feature allows consumers to take a proactive role in tracking their environmental impacts. And by the simpler simply searching for the express pack, um, packaging recycling green initiative page on the platform like uh, Taobao or the Cainyo app. Consumers can easily assess their personal carbon reduction uh, points, points. It's not only raised awareness about the environmental benefit for recycling, but also encourage participation in creating a more sustainable express delivery process. So this is uh, the examples I want to share today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Ren, we think we I think we had a little bit of a audio glitch uh, with the last uh, example, but I think it's uh, pretty well explained in the slide. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ren. Are there any questions to Ms. Ren? No questions. Veronica, any questions? I no, don't... no questions so far. Okay. And again, many thanks. 
Thank you, Ms. Ren. And then I suggest we move to the next speaker, which is uh, Miles Durant from Royal Mail. Uh, not sure if Miles is there. Oh, yeah, yep, I'm here. Hi, Miles. So Hi, everyone. Go ahead. Sure, yeah. For those who haven't met me, I'm Miles from the Environment Team at Royal Mail, USA provider for the UK. So going to talk a little bit about our green surcharge today, which differs from some of the other items talked about in that we're not um, charging for a specifically green product or a specifically green service we're doing, but it's more of a, a way to fund our overall decarbonisation. Um, something that's probably very easily replicated because of how it doesn't require sort of specific technology or routes or anything um, for other posts if they wanted to, but uh, acknowledge it's, it's quite different to what's being done. So on my first slide then, um, what actually is the green surcharge? Well, it's a charge per item that we've mandated on all of our account customers. What I'd say is just those business account customers, so not sort of members of the public. That um, generates a revenue, which is then funded specifically to decarbonize raw mail. Those funds are ring fenced so that they can't be used for anything else. And it also only contributes to the total cost of decarbonization. So that, that pot effectively doesn't exclusively fund our decarbonization. The business is still putting additional money into it as well. It just helps us to decarbonize because we know it's going to be costly. We initially introduced the green surcharge at 2p back in November 2023, which is a pretty small charge per, per parcel, really, when you think about it. Um, and we, we ramped that up to 4p later on in 2024. So why did we introduce the green surcharge? Well, we know that decarbonizing and trying to achieve our net zero by 2040 goal is going to come at a very significant cost. We on this call all know that things like air source heat pumps, electric vehicles, you know, solar panels, all, all of that great stuff has a cost associated with it. And raw mail, like many other posts, is materially loss making. So it's difficult for us to finance that transition. We're going to have to get creative in, in how we do that. So this is a, a way that's going to help us. We looked at a kind of insetting option, whether some of our customers might specifically want to inset with us, but there's not really a standard approach uh, and definition for that. And we're also unsure around what the customer appetite would be if it's kind of like an optional insetting. Um, whereas the value of the green surcharge really is that we have a consistent amount of funds coming in and we can be sure what that's going to be. So it gives us some kind of certainty around funding. We know that our customers need to reduce their scope through emissions. Our largest ones are really pushing us to decarbonize as we're, you know, we're a chunky part of their scope through emissions, really, where we're their logistics providers. So that's uh, something we want to help them with, something we need to help them with. And we don't want to offer sort of offsetting on our um, products. So we don't want to, you know, as an additional charge, we offsetting the emissions of a per certain parcel wasn't really for us. And it doesn't align with our strategy. Neither is saying that any one of our products is lower carbon than the other. We're, we're already the lowest carbon per provider per parcel in the UK. And that's something we're quite proud of. So on the next slide, then I've got some examples of some of the things that we would spend the surcharge on or that we do spend the surcharge on already, actually. It's important to say that um, the funds from the pot are only used on stuff that wouldn't be occurred as business as usual. So um, it's only used on kind of additional costs that are incurred as a, as a result of decarbonizing. One good example of this is we deployed 10 million litres of HVO. So that, that biofuel I know many of us are using, uh, many posts on the call are using. We, we deployed 10 million litres of that last year, ramping up to 27 million litres this year and, and more to come in the future, hopefully. But so we only use the green surcharge to fund that kind of additional cost, the, di the difference in cost between diesel and HVO because we'll be using diesel anyway, right? So we're not going to pull those funds out of the green surcharge, just that, that extra bit. The same applies to things like uh, electric vehicles. It's only that cost difference between the ICE vehicle and the electric vehicle that we're taking out of that, that green surcharge pot, really. So maximizing the benefit that we can get out of those, those green, green revenues. And then on my final slide, we've got some of the kind of common questions that we get. Um, so what's been the main benefit of the green surcharge? I think that any sustainability professional will know that, you know, things can be on the table sometimes and that the decarbonization levers can be on the table and then the business's position changes, the finances change and whatever that item is, a challenge may end up back off the table um, and it creates a kind of uncertain pathway. 
what this does enables us to have a consistent amount of money every year that we can draw on. We have to spend that those funds because we've committed to our customers that we are. Whilst it's only four pence per parcel, you can imagine across the billions of items that we do that results in a significant um, amount of, of revenue. So we're re really able to to keep our decarbonisation levers on the table in financially difficult times. It's, it's proved kind of invaluable over the last um, or nearly nearly twelve months. So while, while it's been in place, but what was the customer reaction? So initially there was a bit of negative attention. Um, it was primarily focused on ensuring that the funds are actually spent appropriately. It wasn't just a price rise or a price play. So a lot of our customers wanted to know exactly what we'd be spending it on, how we'd be ensuring that it was ring fenced and that it wasn't just going into the sort of business's usual piggy pot, um, piggy bank, I guess. Um, so we, we had a document, a reactive document prepped to be able to answer those kind of questions that we shared with all of our sales and commercials colleagues so they could have those dis discussions with their customers. They could really talk them through exactly what we were planning to spend the green surcharge on, what it was, um, and how it kind of differed from other surcharges that are, are in place already. We also applied it. Um, it's the same charge across the country, which aligns with our one price anywhere go, one price goes anywhere type model. How do you provide customer confidence around this? So we have explained it to our customers, just as I'm doing with you now, and also we're having the funds internally audited. We have we have an internal audit team at our parent company, IDS, and they're auditing those funds to make sure that they're being appropriately ring-fenced and spent. In future years, we're hoping that we can actually have this externally audited to provide kind of even more assurance around that. Uh, and, we, and we update annually in our ESG report going forwards exactly what the surcharge has been spent on, although we don't disclose the amount that, that's generated overall. And what products does this apply to? To be completely clear, it doesn't apply to any USO products or any products that you as an individual might purchase from us. It's only commercial products and only from account customers. So that's businesses. The, the kind of products it applies to for anyone who's familiar with our services is like Track24 and Special Delivery. But um, there's a link there to a bit more information on the surcharge and also um, the, the full list of products that it does apply to. And, and that's me there. So any any questions if if you've got any but thank you very much Miles I saw there was one question from Botswana Veronica do you could you perhaps repeat that one yes sure just a second so there is a question from Botswana the organizations that Royal Mail has partnered with for building electric charging infrastructure, do they have Africa-based companies that they're working with or they have plans to expand into Africa? So I don't know specifically, actually, because I'm so not that familiar with the sort of African market, I suppose. But I can say the, the main companies that we're working with so far are charging infrastructure. Most of them have been deployed by BP Pulse. So I wouldn't be surprised if they they are working in Africa in some context. Um, and most of our vehicles have come from Stellantis, who, again, again, are one of the big players, aren't they? So it, it might well be deploying EVs there. Is that sufficient answering your question, Botswana? I believe it's additional homework on our part as we explore um, how we will also have um, charging infrastructures as we look into ensuring that we have um, e, e, e charging stations that could also be potentially revenue generating for the Ghana Post. So we'll explore it further. But thank you so much, Mal. Thank you. I think, Veronica, there was a second question we saw. Yes, and the third one as well. Okay. The second question is, when you, uh, I think it's coming from Gibraltar Post Office. So when you state business and account customers only, is it dependent on quantity amounts they send or is it exclusively any item sent by a business? Yep, so anyone who qualifies as an account customer 
um, so that there is a minimum, I believe there's a minimum volume that you have to uh, meet to become an account customer so that we, we can provide those sort of preferential rates to, uh, because they're a business. Um, but as soon as they reach that point, yeah, the surcharges will apply to them. There's some other surcharges as, as well that we use, but um, the, the green surcharge is what we're talking about today. And the third question, I kind of read that out as I answer it, I suppose. The question is, um, are there any logistics providers that collect the green surcharge in the UK? So we, we're we the only one in the UK who does something like this with, with the green surcharge. To be honest, we kind of expected when we introduced it that others would follow as a way um, of sort of generating funds to, to pay for their decarbonisation. Um, some other businesses do similar things in a way, I suppose. So I'm um, not going to, to like pick, pick names, but some of our competitors charge more to deliver in um, low carbon areas. So, you, you know, like within the ULES in London, um, there'll be a premium charge for that. That's something we decided not to do because we thought it didn't fit with our one price goes everywhere model where we like consistent pricing. So this is the approach we took. Is that sufficiently answered, Artipon? I think it was from Thailand. Yes, yes it is. Yeah. Any yes, other questions? Yes, um, from Thailand, of course. Thank you, Artipon. Thank you for your answer. Any other questions to Miles? I see no other questions or raised oh. hands. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you very much, Miles, for your presentation. Uh, I think we quickly move over now to uh, to James, who will give a short synthesis of um, of the presentations, uh, putting them sort of together and linking them to the topic at hand. So, James, please go ahead. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to uh, our three speakers. Um, uh, just so, just so that everyone is aware, our speakers. Uh, we, this is the second version of this webinar. We, we we were trying to be inclusive and and reach as many people as possible. So, they all uh, were speaking yesterday um, as well. So I thank everyone for uh, for um, coming back today and giving us great presentations again. Okay, so I'm just going to. As Peter said, summarize. Um, oh, create a little summary. So the first two speakers uh, were talking about what I would call the conventional uh, postal green revenue model. So that's when you have a clear environmental issue uh, that society needs to solve. It could be climate, it could be waste, um, it could be air pollution. And then uh, that solution is uh, explored, or uh, trying to solve that problem is, is explored uh, with um, existing or new government, business, or public customers. So it's sort of taking us out of our traditional uh, postal services into environmental services. And that requires partnership, and that requires stepping out of our comfort zones. Um, and it also involves then repurposing and investing in postal assets. So that in, in many cases, that's things like uh, using the existing building fleet, uh, oh, sorry, existing vehicle fleet, excuse me, um, and then adding uh, technology to that fleet or, or expanding the digital infrastructure that we have for data analysis. And then obviously, the revenue it should generate revenue so that's what we're talking about here uh in the conventional model it should generate revenue and uh ideally we should be making a profit on that and so i've got some examples here i won't go into them in detail um what i would like is is if people uh at the end of this um presentation uh could maybe uh, identify things that we've missed off this list examples or send them to us by email um, it's an ever expanding list, but we have lots of examples already. So in uh, for the USPS, there's a, a recycling uh, um, service that the USPS offers to government to recycle e-waste. Uh, in Norway, uh, the post uh, 
is involved in sharing electric vehicle chargers with some of its uh, suppliers um, and charging them for this. So these are all for charge examples, uh, revenue generating. Now, in Ireland, there's a very interesting uh, example of um, essentially uh, offering loans or, or finance for uh, the purchase of electric vehicles and the upgrading of people's homes to be more energy efficient. So that's a really interesting example there. We also hear that uh, from our uh, members or the, our post designated operators that uh, those that are generating solar power, photovoltaics, uh, often sell that back to the uh, to the government or to the energy provider via the grid. Also, the sale of green packaging is very common. Um, and then we, we we there's also several examples of collecting uh, high impact or high value recyclables. In some cases, this doesn't generate much revenue. It's cost neutral. Uh, I, I have heard examples of where it does bring in some some revenue. And then we can look at some other examples which are emerging. So that there's a, there's a big initiative um, that's. Uh, headed up by various UN agencies around, uh, it's called Early Warnings for All. Um, and this is the idea that uh, whenever there's an extreme weather event um, in, a, in a country that citizens needs to be, uh, they need to know how to react and they need to be alerted as to when that uh, heat wave, for example, is, is about to hit. And posts could potentially play a really important role in that using the different infrastructures that they manage. There's also the sale of uh, insurance products related to climate, again, um, for extreme weather. Um, and then various types of public information campaigns to support government priorities. So again, that's about uh, offering services to government. It's kind of like government procurement. If the government wants to uh, encourage a particularly environmentally responsible behaviour uh, by its citizens, or it wants to let them know that they have new, let's say, recycling facilities available, the post is very well placed to actually getting that message out. So these are all services, green or environmental services, that the post is or can offer and charge. Now, so we have these two different types of examples. The, the first two um, presentations, we're talking about green or environmental services that the post can offer and charge for. So the if you look at the images on the right, the top one is taken from the presentation by Geoptis. And uh, this is an example of uh, adding an air quality uh, monitoring device to the roof of the vehicle so that they can collect uh, very high resolution um, air quality data. And that can be sold um, or it can be uh, the data can be processed and that can be sold to local governments. Um, so that's an environmental service that's very outward looking. But at the same time, we heard from all of the presenters that it's important that the vehicles, let's say, and the uh, buildings that um, that are needed to actually offer that environmental service are also green or environmentally friendly. So there's these two different elements. And it's about um, I think that's a key message really about consistent values. We shouldn't be offering environmental services to customers if our infrastructure isn't environmentally friendly, because that poses a you know, a reputational risk to the, the organization. Um, so that's when Miles, the presentation from Miles, I think really uh, hits home. Uh, in that case, we're not talking about a an environmental service, but we are talking about green revenue through a surcharge that can be used to improve the environmental um, credentials of core postal operations. So I just wanted to make the distinction between these two types of uh, green revenue. So we do have uh, some time, uh, quite limited. We've only got five minutes, really, for, for additional questions. We've we've had some already. Um, I'm I'm not going to go through these in detail. I'll just pick out a couple, uh, maybe leave it on the screen, um, and then I'll hand back to Peter. Um, but you know, are there any major types of green services the post could offer? Maybe they're already offering that we haven't mentioned yet. Um, are there some emerging uh, models or uh, environmental problems that networks could solve? What's the role of regulation and government? Um, what's the role of data management? 
and also this idea of clustering or offering green multiple green services does it make sense to offer them on their own or does it help to offer uh, ecosystem of services is that really important so i'll leave i'll leave these on the screen uh, for a couple of minutes and maybe hand back to peter thank you very much james um yeah can repeat the the question from james are there any uh, examples from your organization that you would like to uh, to draw attention to, uh, ideas you have. Um, there were already, I, I realized, quite a few examples, and, uh, and James uh, mentioned a few others as well, so it might not be easy to come up with other ideas or products that you have developed, uh, but if you have them, uh, I'm not sure, Veronica, are there any in the chat? I don't see any so okay. far. Then I had uh, I have a question. I saw that Colin from Boston Bring is in the call. Colin, are you still there? Yes, Peter, I'm here. Because uh, James... Uh, brought up your uh, your product, your example up as well. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit, how you can make uh, a business case out of that uh, charging? Well, basically, we are um, deploying a, a national charging infrastructure for electric vehicles here in Norway, and uh, the public infrastructure is not sufficient uh, in terms of the, the rate that... Uh, our subcontractors also rolling out vehicles and they need to charge. And obviously they uh, they visit our terminals as well. So um, we are then combining the usage of the charging infrastructure for our own vehicles and for our subcontractors. Um, and that's obviously gives an opportunity for a small premium on, on the pricing there. And that's, uh, I think, going to be an, an interesting uh, development going forward where this can probably increase in scope. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Christine, are you are you on the call? Uh, sorry, are you are you able to speak? I think I mentioned to you, to you uh, last week about this um, the government the federal uh, electronic waste recycling that uh, the USPS is involved in. Could you maybe say a couple of words about that? Hi, James. Yeah, this is Christine. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, I am from uh, U.S. Postal Service. Um, yeah, last week, uh, James and I were talking just a little bit about what we call our um, USPS Blue Earth Federal Recycling Program. So that's where the U.S. Postal Service helps um, other U.S. government agencies recycle small electronics and print cartridges. So um, at this time, you know, it's not something that we can offer to all consumers, right? But we can offer it to um, our U.S. federal government peers. So that's something um, that we've worked on here. And um, we've had some, you know, pretty decent results. You know, we make a little bit of money from that. And then also, obviously, we're caring for the earth as well. So we're definitely uh, proud of that particular program. Thank you very much. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but I think you know uh, it's really nice to hear um, just some some of these, uh, even if it's a short example. I mean, I was curious because I, I when I saw this uh, this service, it did make me think that there's probably all sorts of opportunities to provide government um, gov services to governments to com government departments um, around the environment. Um, we we saw that with Geoptis that they their, their connection is really with the uh, local government. Um, or local authorities, um, and it's. I think, as I understand, it's not. Isn't it's not generating huge amounts of revenue, but maybe for some countries that would be different. For some postal operators, that would be different. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. Do we have an, anyone else on the call that would like to uh, chip in on that, or if they have any questions, um, we we rushed uh, uh, our presenters or encouraged them to keep it short. Uh, so no, we, we get a few, space. James. We get okay. uh, Franklin first. Uh, hi, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Franklin Furtado. I'm from the Ministry of Communications in Brazil. 
And uh, just to share uh, that we, we are right now here in Brazil um, reviewing the, 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 the regulatory framework for, for, for the post. We, we regulate here only the, the designated operator, not, not the whole sector, not the whole postal sector in, in the country, but the, the, the universal service and the, the, the designated operator uh, services they, 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 they deliver. And, and uh, since last year, uh, when we had a, a, a conference on, reg on regulatory issues in, in, at the UPU, um, we, the, uh, the, the regulators were put on on, 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 okay. on spot under spot oh, to, mm -hmm. to 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 uh, uh, on whether they they're working or not on the um, on the, the the environmental issues for for, for regulating. Um, and and since then, uh, here in Brazil, we decided to 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 start uh, 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 to to establish new goals for the for the the, the designated operator for Correios to 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 follow. Uh, it will start next year, and uh, we we will start to 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 measure and to 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 follow up uh, the, the 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 what they 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 are aiming to to reduce on, on carbon emission and now it's very linked also to to the to the to the goals that were established uh in last congress in, in, in Riyadh. and uh but now but now uh, as a, as uh, the ministry of communication as a regulator we are we are also uh making a follow up follow up on on what what they 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 are going to do and uh what they they, they aim to reduce on this so uh, just to, to try to address uh, the, the the regulatory question uh, you 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 showed, uh, James, and uh, to 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 share with you what we are doing here on this matter. Thank you. Obrigado. Then I see we have another hand, Margot. Yes. Margot is back. Hi, Hi Hi, James. Uh, I just wanted to, to make a comment um, on uh, one example you show, James, in the, the list of examples about the sharing of uh, the charging infrastructure. Uh, because um, in La Poste, we have developed our own charging infrastructure quite a long time ago, before the, the public infrastructure was, I mean, at that time was almost no zero uh, public infrastructure. So really, we, we had to develop our own uh, infrastructure for the charging of uh, electric vehicles. Um, and we have had a lot of reflections internally uh, on how to be able to share this infrastructure with uh, the customers in particular. Um, and uh, we are still, we were and we are still faced with a, a lot of technical and regulatory issues. Uh, so in that sense, I think it would be useful. I, I saw that other uh, postal companies are able to, to do that. Uh, so definitely it would be useful to see uh, if some of the technical issues we, we have, I mean, maybe for regulatory issues, it's more difficult. Uh, but uh, yes, how we can um, overcome uh, these obstacles, because definitely there is a, an opportunity there. But uh, at La Poste, at least, we have not been able to, to solve the, the obstacles we were facing with um, in order to share our uh, charging infrastructure. Just just to be clear for me, Marco, you're talking about regulatory difficulties, not so much the charging infrastructure technically or the supply of electricity. I think it's also technical. Ah, it's it's yeah. both technical and regulatory. I think it's about the pricing and uh, the payment. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I'm not yeah. an expert, but I, I know that uh, there are yeah. uh, both technical and regulatory obstacles. Probably peak usage and uh, other industries needed uh, electricity as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. I think James also... Yeah, I, I thought I thought I'd maybe chip in on that if there's no one else to speak, because the last two uh, comments that we had from Franklin and Margot, um, they did t touch on regulation. And I, I think this is maybe one of the challenges. We see this with social services um, as well as environmental services, um, that as soon as a postal operator wants to get involved in recycling or wants to get involved in uh, the sale of uh, energy, or the sharing of infrastructure that's related to energy, um, then suddenly that they have to deal with a whole different set of regulations and regulate 
sectors that um, so it's, it becomes a non-traditional postal service. Um, so I, I, I will be contacting uh, Franklin and Margot, I think, uh, after this uh, webinar to find out a little bit more about their challenges, because I think um, as we start to get into the practical details, these issues around regulation keep cropping up um, and, you know, how different, how the, the postal regulator and the environmental regulator within the same country, how they engage with each other. Is that easy to do? Um, but that, I think that's a big part of the, the it's, it's one piece of the puzzle, I think, for, for unlocking um, these the potential for postal operators to offer uh, environmental services and to make money from that. Um, there's certainly a lot of money available um, for climate, for example. So it's a big opportunity, but we need to kind of understand a little bit more about the practical issues around regulation, I think. So thank okay. you for bringing those examples. Thank you, James. And looking at the time, we are exactly on an hour. So uh, I think it's now time to, to finish up. So I would like to thank you all for your uh, input, for your time for the discussions, and especially, of course, I want to thank you, thank the three presenters, uh, Adeline, Ren, and Miles, for their contribution, for their great examples and the different examples. Um, and of course, um, I have to say that we will have a new joint webinar in October, uh, but we will come to you perhaps on that issue that James just mentioned, but perhaps also on another issue that might be completely different. We haven't decided yet. Uh, anyway, we'll, we will let you know in time. For now, I, uh, again, many thanks for your uh, participation. Have a great morning. Have a great afternoon. Have a great evening. And for those in Europe, enjoy the soccer coming up in an hour. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye. Sure. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.